As we begin the new millennium, the church invites everyone to join in this celebration. This television program is a response to the Holy Father's call. Please join us as we journey together in faith with Jesus into the new millennium. <clears throat> first of all, boy, it's loud. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, put something for all of you here today. You know, many of us priests are very exhausted because we've been hearing confessions nonstop. And at all these conferences, there's always someone who gets their feelings hurt because we didn't look at you or we didn't, we walked by you or... I remember I got a letter in my office the other day and it said, um, Father Roberts, I, you brought me to God through television and I couldn't wait to meet you and I converted through watching you on TV, etc., etc. And I finally got to meet you in an elevator and I told you all this and all you said was God bless you. And you got out of the elevator. She said, I was crushed. Well, I don't know what else she expected me to say in an elevator, but, <laughs> but you know, that happens all the time, and I'm sure every one of the speakers gets that. If we've hurt anybody, if we, if we seem to ignore you, or we won't buy you, it's because we didn't really notice, okay? I'm sure every one of us priests wants to be reaching out to every individual one. But we do get tired, and especially today, I know, all the priests are exhausted because we've been hearing confessions non-stop. And I was really dizzy from hearing confessions, so... Uh, <laughs> if I was abrupt, if I cut you short, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, but I had to get here for a talk. I think that's important to say that because I know so often priests get blamed for things they didn't mean. So if we have seemingly been abrupt or didn't notice you or it wasn't meant, okay? God bless you. I thank my very good friend, Father Stephen, for that wonderful talk he gave last night on the Eucharist, because that, <clears throat> that covers 70% of the things I wanted to say. <laughs> but I'll talk about the other 30% he didn't say, okay. Today's topic, as I look at the uh, program, is Jesus' presence, his true presence, in the Mass. And the theme of this conference is pray, isn't it, up there, about prayer and peace. So I always like to pick one word so you remember. So the topic is prayer, and the most important of all the prayers, there is no prayer comparable to it, and that's the Mass. So it sums up what we... The Mass is... There's no other prayer in the world, no prayer, that compares to the Mass. And I think Father Stephen made that very clear last night. He gave you wonderful background, tradition, linked the Jewish faith up with our modern Christian faith and our own traditions as Catholics, which many Catholics seem to have forgotten. You know, the Blessed Mother is looking through the messages of Medjugorje, and almost every message Mary talks about is prayer. She says, you're not praying enough. And you know, when you think about it, those messages were given to the people of St. James. We just shared in them. It was like if someone got your parish bulletin and they shared it in another parish. Basically, what's said in the parish bulletin is for you, the parish, right? And when you think that we, we read it and said, you're not praying enough, we said, that means us. It meant the people of Medjugorje. <laughs> First and foremost, Mary was talking to St. James Parish. And she took a very ordinary parish, not a fantastic parish, not an extraordinary parish, just an ordinary parish in an ordinary little village as a model for the world. So that by all the world sharing in the messages to that parish, we could all be inspired in coffee, right? So when you think about that, as she continues to come, and has come over these many years, she keeps saying, you're not praying enough. You're not praying properly. Pray, pray, pray. And she came as the Queen of Peace. Now, many people say to me, Father, you know, isn't it extraordinary that Mary came as the Queen of Peace and there's never been a more horrible war than there was in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia. But she came when there was peace. 
And isn't it amazing that it was on the exact 10th anniversary when the Serbia started this war with Croatia? It was the 10th anniversary of Medjugorje, a decade of the rosary. She gave them 10 years to start praying, to turn their life over to God. And she kept telling them, you're not praying right yet. You're still not praying properly. There's one message that said, you're not all going to Mass. She warned them. What a horrible war they had. She came as the Queen of Peace so that they would have peace. And I think that's a warning to the rest of us. If Major Gloria wasn't praying enough, if the people of St. James Parish weren't praying enough, if that parishioners there weren't all going to Mass, what about the United States, where over half of the Catholics don't go to Mass, and where 80% of the ones who do don't even pray? <laughs> so I want to talk about that, Jesus' presence in the Mass. First of all, the part that maybe 90% of Catholics miss is the first part of the Mass. I usually start off every mission talk with this, and if you watch me on TV or you've been to a parish mission or another conference, you'll say, oh, he said that before. But Mary keeps repeating herself too. <laughs> because we didn't hear it the first time. What I always ask Catholics is, what were the readings last Sunday? I've asked this all over the world. Every Catholic church, every week I say it, wherever I'm at, I say, what were the readings the last time you were at Mass? They go, what were they? And yet every one of us believes that it's the Word of God. So I want to talk about that part of the Mass. See, it's not just Jesus present in the Eucharist. He's truly present in the Word. And that came to my mind very clearly the other week. I was up at a Marian conference in North Dakota, in Fargo. And I did the opening address. And they got the videos going like they've got them here and the audio. And people were lining up for tapes next day, and none of the sound came out. <laughs> they had a gorgeous video with no sound. <laughs> and there was no sound in the audio tapes. And people were angry. They said, Father, we want to get that tape. You gave a talk on confession. And they didn't have any talk. It was blank. But they had a wonderful picture of me on video in silence. You know, then they could have played it, and I would have been truly present in the video. <laughs> but they wouldn't have had a clue what I said unless they could lip-read. <laughs> and so that's what's happening at Mass. Catholics, most by and large, are going to Mass for the silent presence of Jesus. And the Protestants go with the picture turned off and the sound turned on. But you know, you get an audio tape, you can at least get the message. <laughs> you are also present in an audio tape. But which would have more effect on your life, getting an audio tape of a speech or a videotape with the sound turned off? <laughs> How would I be most present? How would I be present in a way that would change your life? Now apply that to Jesus Christ. I've often been asked, at ecumenical gatherings, what can Catholics and Protestants learn from each other? Because Mary is asking us to be ecumenical, too. So that we, not, if we don't just, he doesn't just belong to Catholics, which may come as a surprise. There's some Protestants here, I'm sure. I met one Lutheran minister. <laughs> See, I met a little Baptist girl once when I was chaplain at a reform school. She was praying a rosary, and I knew her daddy was a Baptist minister. She was there praying the rosary. And I said, Sandy, I thought you were Baptist. She said, I am, Father. I said, you're praying the rosary? This is before Medjugorje. She said, she's my mother too, Father. <laughs> and I, what I think we've learned from each other over these post-Vatican two years is that Mary is not just Catholic. She also belongs to the non-Catholic. She belongs to all those who call Jesus their brother, Jesus Lord, Jesus Savior. But what the Protestants can learn from us, especially coming from these meetings, I hope, is that the Bible is not just Protestant. 
In fact, it was Catholic before it was Protestant. That's Steve. <laughs> But what can we learn about each other as far as worship in finding Christ? See, many, many people in California, many, in fact, probably millions of you, have left the church to go to non-denominational churches. And many of you came from Catholic backgrounds. I go all over California and see Assemblia de Dios, Spanish. I always say an Hispanic who's not Catholic is a breeder without beans. <laughs> How come so many Hispanics are not Catholic anymore? How come so many in South America, and their millions, and Central America, are leaving the church in droves to go to non-denominational churches? Why? Because they're learning something there that we didn't give them as Catholics. They're being fed with the Word. So what can we learn from the Protestants? We can learn to preach the Word like they do. There's power in the Word, power in the preach Word that's Spirit-filled, but it's absolutely dead when it's just read and not proclaimed. I remember one church I was at in Chicago, it was a rejoicing Sunday, and I was up there, and I was always a celebrant, and the, and the uh, lecturer came over with his church face. We, we Catholics have church faces. I don't know why that is. I was watching you last night. I turned to Father Pharisee. I said, Father, if this was a charismatic gathering, they'd be wild by now. But they're all so quiet. <laughs> Why are we scared to let go? Because we were brought up to have a church face. Some people even have a church voice. Let us pray. <laughs> anyway, this Sunday, it was a rejoicing Sunday. That's the Sunday when you have a station break in Lent. And the lector went over to the reading. I think he was a mortician. <laughs> he went over the reading, he went like this, church face. Rejoice. <laughs> Again, I say, rejoice. <laughs> and the congregation that respond that week the psalm response was, we are filled with joy. Well, there was a thousand people there, and they said, we are filled with joy. <laughs> they told God it six times. I stopped the mass that Sunday. I said, don't lie in God's house. God knows you're not filled with joy. Don't tell him lies. I said, if that's what you look like when you're filled with joy, God help you when you're sad. <laughs> well, then they all laughed just like you, and then they were filled with joy. I was going to change the psalm response that we are bored to death. <laughs> and God would have said, and so am I. I'm going to go to a few of these matters. <laughs> so that uh, what we can learn from the Protestants is their joy in their faith. You know, when I watch the other channel, TBN, I think it's here from California, when you watch those people, their faces are lit up. When they're coming to Christ, there's joy. They may be crying, but there's joyful tears. They're excited about Jesus Christ. And the preachers preach on fire with Christ. So we've we got the same Bible. So why can't we do that? Can you imagine what it would be like at Mass if we preached with the fire of those preachers? See, we have an advantage. I, one of the reasons why Catholics don't remember the Word is because there's too many readings at Mass, especially on Sunday. You have the first reading from the Old Testament, then you have a Psalm of David, and then you have another reading from Paul or Hebrews or an Acts, then you have an Alleluia, then you have the Gospel. And I usually time the Liturgy of the Word on a Sunday. It usually takes 20 to 25 minutes to get to the Gospel. And then the priest gets 10 minutes to preach. How can he preach in 10 minutes what takes 25 minutes to read? By the time he's got to the gospel, he's forgotten what the first reading was. <laughs> <clears throat> so why do we have so many readings? Because we want to get through the Bible in three years. <laughs> do you know, I bet you 90% of Catholics don't know 
that if you go to Mass for three years, you cover the whole Bible? How's that for a full Bible church? The next time you're asked to join a full Bible church, tell them you're in one. <laughs> now, why is it that when I ask Catholics what the Word of God was at Mass, they can't remember? And I bet you most of you can. You're the cream of the crop. See, because there's too many readings, and the priest didn't get time to preach them all. And some priests try to preach all the readings, and that's impossible in 10 minutes. How can you do justice to three readings and a psalm in 10 minutes? You couldn't. So if you try to cover too many topics, which all those readings cover, you finish up with a mass of knowledge, and you can't remember what it was about. Some priests even read their sermons. I met was at one church once where a priest was reading a sermon, and one old lady turned to the other. She said, if he can't remember it himself, how does he expect us to remember it? <laughs> So, what does the Protestants do that, that we could learn from? And so I watch, and I turn on these other channels with the other preachers, and I notice <coughs> that if you listen to them, and at the end of their talk, you could sum up their talk in one word. If the preacher's preaching on faith, all the scriptures are dealing with faith. If he's preaching on joy, all the scriptures are dealing with joy. If he's preaching on salvation, all the scriptures are dealing with salvation. See, they do it differently to us. They decide what they want to preach. Then they find the scriptures to fit what they want to preach. And it's usually a one-word theme. That's why people remember it. That's why they feel they're being fed. And they all come with a Bible. And the preacher says, open up your Bible app. And he gives them a verse, and they mark it with their highlighter. Then he gives them another verse, and they mark it with their highlighter. And all those verses will deal with one word topic. But the priest doesn't have that advantage, does he? The priest is set with the continuous readings from last week. Because we're continuing through the Bible. So there's all kinds of themes there. And so what I decided to do, since I can't change the lectionary... By the way, there's two things I want you to remember. That if you're Catholic, on any given day, in any city or any country, every Roman Catholic's hearing the same word of God. If you're in Japan, you'll hear it in Japanese. If you're in Croatia, you'll hear it in Croatian. If you're in Italy, you'll hear it in Italian. Every Catholic in the world, from the Pope down to the smallest child, hears the same first reading, hears, has the same psalm, has the same second reading, has the same hallelujah verse and the same gospel, unless you're at a conference. And then they change it, they're special masses. But other than that, all Catholics are hearing the same word of God on the same day. And what amazes me, Catholics have come up to me, especially Medjugorje ones, and say, Father, what was the message of Our Lady this month? I usually say, I don't know. You don't know, and you're a Medjugorje priest. <laughs> and I say, what was the gospel on Sunday? <laughs> See, some people are more worried about the messages than they are about the Scripture. One lady called me once at the office, and she spent six months going over all the messages of all the visionaries all over the world. Akita, Japan, uh, Britannia. Conyers, Georgia, Phoenix, Arizona, Denver, Colorado. And she was getting confused with all these messages. And she said, I've got it all on computer, and I spent six months getting it all ready. I said, why didn't you spend that much time studying Scripture? <laughs> then you wouldn't be confused. <laughs> See, whether or not the messages of any apparition are true or not, we wait on the church. But the fact that the Word of God that you hear at any given Mass, on any given day, is the Word of God for the church is infallible. The church has approved that. The church says this is the Word of God. This is God's Word to His church today. There's the message you've got to live for the day. The Word of God from the liturgy. There's the message. Maybe if we were doing that, Mary wouldn't have to keep coming, telling us. 
You're not praying enough. You're not listening properly, okay? So if we were listening to what she was saying, she would take us back to the Word of God, to the Scriptures, to the Mass. So we Catholics are a unique position that not only do we cover the entire Bible in three years, that on any given day we are one in the Word. One in the Word. And so what I do, I can't change the readings, but I can pick a word from the readings. And what I've been teaching, there's many priests here, and if, if I can pass it on to my brother priest, do it. Try it for a couple of months and see if it works. Next Sunday, get up and pick a word. One word. Tell your congregation what that one word is. Stick to that one word. Preach that one word. And they'll think you're a good Protestant preacher. <laughs> and then you would have learned from the Protestants. That's where I learned it. And so I always pick a single word. Every day of my life, I take one word from the readings. And I preach on that one word. That's why they don't call me the playboy priest anymore. Now I'm called Father Pick a Word. <laughs> you see, my one word last Sunday was love. Do you remember the readings now? Which is the greatest commandment? You had it in the first reading and in the gospel, didn't you? It summed up the whole scripture. summed up the whole Bible, didn't it? So I preached about the love of God, neighbor, and self. See, the talk was on love. I didn't touch the second reading. I don't remember what the second reading was. I don't have to. I got my feeding from the first reading in the gospel by picking one word. So if you do that for the rest of your life, if I just did that, if I got that much across, that for the rest of your life, you'll never go to Mass without getting a word. And you, oh, every day you go to Mass, you pick a word, find a verse with the word in it, recall it all day long, try and live it all day long, and your life will change. You'll be converted. You'll have great faith. You'll have peace. You'll be doing what Mary says, celebrating the Mass. I looked through the many messages, too many for me to remember. How many times she talks about the Mass? She says, love the Mass. Love the Mass. Live the Mass. She says, when you're at, before the Blessed Sacrament, I'm there, adoring him too. She tells us there is no greater prayer in the universe than the Holy Mass. But we knew that from the teachings of the church. Even those who don't believe in Medjugorje have to believe it from the teachings of the church. Why is the Mass so powerful? Because it's not your prayer, and it's not my prayer. It's Jesus Christ's prayer, the Son of God. It's his prayer. Stephen told you that last night. It's Christ who's being offered. It's Christ who's present. It's Christ who's offering the sacrifice. This one eternal sacrifice is being offered every day because it's out of time and space. One of the objections I usually hear from non-Catholic brothers and sisters, is they say, doesn't it say in Hebrews that Christ, unlike the, the priest of the Old Testament, offered the sacrifice once for their sins and the sins of the people, yet you Catholics say it's done every day. Now, which is right, you or the Bible. The Catholic Church says every time you go to Mass, you're present at the sacrifice. The Bible says it was done once. And Stephen touched on that last night. The way I explain that, especially so kids can understand, I'm giving this talk once, once and once only. And it's being videotaped and audio taped. And if you get that tape and play it back, every time you play it back, you'll be present here again. I'm not doing it again. But as many times as you play the tape until the tape wears out, it's, pre it's present again. People that are not even at this conference. If you take a video and give it to your friend, your friend's not here, but they would be present here through the video. But I'm not doing it again. And every time it's played, I will be present to them, hopefully with sound and picture. <laughs> Uh, 
I've always heard people talking about Jesus being alive, but I never really experienced the risen Jesus until I invited him into my heart and into my life. Only then did I experience Jesus alive. If you have that same experience, you haven't experienced the risen Jesus and Jesus truly being alive in your heart and in your life, now is a great opportunity for you to, to amend that. Why don't you pray with me? Short little prayer. I invite Jesus into your heart and into your life and ask the Lord to reveal himself to you in a real way so that you too will have no doubt that Christ is alive and well and living in here. Okay? Let's invite him. Dear Lord Jesus, I open up my heart and my life to you. I invite you, Lord, to come into my heart and into my life and to dwell in my heart forever. Lord, I ask you to fill me with your grace and with your Holy Spirit. Help me, Lord Jesus, to amend my life. Help me, Lord, by your grace to follow you. Help me, Lord, to love you. And help me, Lord, day by day to get to, get to know you in a real and personal way. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for for dying on the cross and for paying the price for my redemption. I thank you, Lord, for that act of love that you did for me. Lord, from this moment on, you are my Lord and Savior. I acknowledge you as my Lord and Savior. And I thank you, Lord, for every blessing, for every grace. Amen. Okay, if you pray that prayer, the Lord Jesus is in your heart. No one else can ever invite Jesus into your heart but you. Only you can do that. And if you've done that, God bless you. Because he's been waiting all your life for just that moment. 